I want to thank you all for coming tonight. All right. Hi, my name is Stephanie Hamilton. I'm the president of the Anacortes Chamber of Commerce, and we're just so happy that you took the time to come out and meet the candidates and hear from the candidates and ask the candidates questions. So before we get started, my friend Dan Mall in the back, Dan. Dan has question slips, and if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand and he can bring you a slip, and then those will go to our team of question vetters who are actually standing in the back, um, Miss Robin Pestorino and Miss Pam Allen. If you guys could wave, there we are. So they're part of our uh, steering committee and they just kind of make sure that the questions are pertinent and not duplicates. And frankly, in the good spirit of what we're here for. So uh, tonight we're gonna hear from the hospital levy and then from the hospital commission candidate, and then from the port commission candidates and the city council candidate, and ending with the mayor. And so that's how it's going to go. Um, so I have a couple things. First of all, our moderators this evening, um, Representative Jeff Morris. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. And uh, Jason Easton, who is part of the steering committee to put on this event tonight. So um, the first panel, the uh, am I too am I sounding too crazy? It feels really loud. Um, the first panel is really about the hospital levy that's going to be on the ballot on August first. They're actually going to get three minutes to open, and then they'll have some questions with one minute answers. So Amanda Hubick, please stand, Amanda. This is Amanda, and she's working with Richard Rydell as the timer. So Amanda. Why don't you show the folks out there first, when you're speaking with your two minutes <clears throat> opening, as you will as a candidate, when you get to 30 seconds, she'll be sitting right up front, you'll see that. And when you get to 10, you're gonna see that. And when it's done, there you go. So she'll be sitting right up front with a nice smile on her face. Uh, she won't cut you off, that will be Jason's job. <laughs> So uh, why don't you show those guys here too for their 30 seconds. There you go, 10, and end. So there we go. So we're kind of a little bit like the League of Women Voters, but not all the way. <laughs> so, so great. Um, in, your, in the brochure, the, the program you had tonight, it talks about turning off your devices, which I just have to remember to do myself. Um, also, this is going to be recorded. It will be on channel 10, and I'm pretty sure it'll be on the, um, the city's website, so I'll be sending out a link We'll let the paper know um, that there'll be a link for people to go look at that. So unless you're from the press, we'd like you to refrain from taking pictures. So I've got three members of the press here right now. They're set for that. I think it's a little distracting for our candidates. So if we could just, just refrain from that. Um, and then I think that's all. So thanks again for taking time. I'm going to actually kind of be the voice over there as the host. And you'll hear mostly from my friends Jason and Jeff, and of course our candidates. So thanks again, and um, I will. All right, let's get started. So tonight we're going to discuss first on the docket is the Island Hospital M&O Levy. We have a series of questions for you, and we also <coughs> need some time for an opening statement. So we'll, I'm not sure which one of you is gonna give your opening statement. Warren, go ahead. Okay, thank you, hello. I'm Warren Tesler, and I'm here today as a commissioner of Island Hospital. We thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today and to explain why the Island, why the Hospital Commission decided to ask voters for an increase in our annual maintenance and operations, known as the M&O levy. Island Hospital has always had a special relationship with our community, and delivering exceptional, compassionate care is very important to us. In fact, Island Hospital has received numerous honors for delivering high-quality patient care. We are, one of, we are one of only nine four-star hospitals in Washington as rated by Medicare's rigorous standards. Island Hospital has earned dozens of other awards, 
but because time is limited tonight, I really can't mention them. But if you're interested, please visit islandhospital.org to read about them. Your support is just as important today as it was 60 years ago when Island Hospital was founded. Without the support of our many volunteers, generous foundation support, and tax dollars, we would not be able to maintain the quality care we now provide. While taxes only account for 3% of our annual $100 million budget, they are an important source of revenue to help us maintain our facilities and equipment. 97% of our budget comes from patient revenues, with a small amount from coming from foundation dollars. I would like to emphasize that tax dollars have never been used to pay employees salaries or benefits. But while our revenues are expected to total about $100.7 million this year, expenses are anticipa anticipated to be about $99.7 million. Our hospital faces a, a significant challenge. We have a growing backlog of needed technology and facility upgrades that range from advanced technology and equipment to upgrades of facilities to maintain functionality. These include a new electronic medical record system costing $12 million, facility upgrades that will cost $8.8 .8 million over the next few years, and diagnostic imaging equipment that includes 3D mammography. We are not able to fully undertake these needed improvements and maintenance upgrades because the costs are outpacing revenues from all sources. That's why we need to increase our maintenance and operation levy. Our current m and levy yields about $1 million a year. However, that money is earmarked to pay off a $10 million bond that's associated with the 2005 construction of the new hospital project and subsequent renovation of other buildings. At the same time, the district spends three to five million dollars every year on planned and emergency capital projects. So annual capital, capital improvements are funded using patient and other hospital revenues. We need a sustainable financing solution to help pay for this backlog of capital projects. Island Hospital Commissioners are asking our community to approve a 31 cent increase in our m and property tax levy on the August 1 ballot. This increase will provide us with an additional $1.7 million per year. It's not a decision we made lightly. In fact, this is the first time in more than 30 years that voters have been asked to increase the m and levy. As context, you should know that hospital district residents pay the lowest property tax rate in Skagit County. Warren, we're going to switch to the questions now. Okay. Sorry to cut you off. Um, how will the island hospital how will Island Hospital lower costs or make significant changes to avoid ongoing reliance, not only on the proposed levy, but future increases in levy funding? And either one of you can answer that. Uh, <clears throat> right now, Island Hospital is the lowest cost hospital in the state of Washington. We have worked over the years to keep our costs very low. We are the epitome of what people today want, which is high value and high quality. Our scores are fantastic, and our rates are the lowest. Our discharge rates are, again, the lowest. So the money that we get, if approved, is going to be for capital improvements to make sure that we can continue high-quality care at the lowest cost. Your next question. Thank you, Vince. Island Hospital considered an affiliation to improve its cost structure, among other things, but the affiliation was dropped due to a lack of public support. Is it time to inform the public what the cost of going it alone is going to be to keep the hospital independent and the ongoing commitment it will require? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, we did go through the journey. It took two years to find out what affiliation meant. And frankly, ladies and gentlemen, there is no silver bullet in affiliating or merging with anyone. There is no one out there who's going to write a check and keep the hospital afloat. What they would do is basically take over the complete operations of the hospital. They would change the fabric of what kind of care is delivered in Anacortes. And we felt at the time that that really wasn't the prudent move. And frankly, five years later, we are still tickled that our decision was the right one, and it was the right one for the patients, for the community, and for the hospital. So right now, what we do is we work collaboratively with all other hospitals, all of them. 
and we don't mix our finances, and we have a great track record with the University of Washington, Providence, and Skagit Regional Health. Thank you, Vince. The next question. <laughs> the next question. This levy comes on the heel of many other tax property tax increases in Anacortes. Could you please justify this for the audience? Well, I mean, those other increases went to other organizations. I mean, we, we've proven ourselves <coughs> to be very careful stewards of the taxpayers' money. As I pointed out, the, you know, the last time that we went to the voters for anything on the m and levy was 30 years ago, and that was for a 21 cent uh, tax uh, levy on the, on the m and levy. This is, you know, and we've managed that money well. I said it's 30 years since we've asked for an increase on that, and here, and, and here we are. It's, it's not like we keep coming around asking for an increase on that. You know, we, we were here in 2005 for a bond levy for the new building. Uh, that's a, an entirely different issue. But, you know, we can't be accountable for, you know, the school district or the city or other, uh, other ed entities that are out there. But, you know, we thought long and hard about this. This is for very important things that you, we all take advantage of, technology, important <coughs> equipment in the operating room, everything like that. So it's very necessary. What upgrades have you made in technology and specifically what upgrades need to be made? Well, in the world of technology, it's interesting to note that uh, Island Hospital back in 1992 installed their electronic medical record and met with great response by uh, the state of Washington as being one of the first. We have now squeezed all of the magic out of our Meditech magic system and it is time to upgrade. All through these years, we have upgraded our CT scanner, our MRIs. Uh, we have upgraded the entire facility. And now we are looking to the future for a sustainable revenue stream to continue to upgrade the facilities in terms of new 3D imaging, in terms of new heating, ventilation, and air conditioning for surgical suites, including new roofs. We have spent three to five million dollars every year for the last 17 years improving our building and now we need some help thank you gentlemen that's it okay that's thank it. you thank you thank you everybody thank you. thank you thank you so much uh we're gonna have jan iverson from the hospital commission come up and just switch over real quick Those two speakers previously were about the same height as me, so I didn't have to adjust nice. the chair. I also <laughs> wanted to take a moment um, to thank some of our elected officials who took some time to come here tonight. Representative Chris Litton, thank you for coming up. That's awesome. You've had a long haul along with Jeff down on Olympia. I don't think it's quite over yet, but we really appreciate all your hard work. Ron Wieson, our commissioner from Skagit County, thanks for being here. I see quite a few city council people. We've got, why don't you guys just wave real quick and then I can see you all. I see well, Matt Miller who's running and then we also have Eric Johnson and Bruce McDougall here. Um, we also have in the audience some port commissioners who came and I really appreciate that. John Pope, I thought Keith Rubin, they're hiding from me, they're right there. So thank you so much. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing on this beautiful Thursday evening. So thanks for being engaged. And we'll move forward with my good friend, Jeff, who is also a great elected official, and we appreciate him being here as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Jan, good evening. 
The All format right. today is going to be a two-minute opening statement and then four questions. And if you get through the, them quick enough, there will be a bonus question at the end. Please start when you're ready. Okay. I'd like to thank our sponsors for all their hard work organizing tonight's forum. I'm Jan Iverson, and I'm an incumbent candidate for hospital commissioner at Island Hospital. I've been a commissioner for 12 years. Yes, it's been wonderful. Commissioners have the ultimate fiduciary responsibility for the hospital district. We legislate and set overall policy for district operations, including budgets. Commissioner's role includes a strong personal commitment to serve the health care needs of our community, providing health services appropriate to their needs and ensuring that you have access to quality health services. During my 12 years as a commissioner, Island Hospital has grown from a small local hospital into our current 43-bed award-winning facility. We offer telestroke collaboration with Swedish Hospital, psychiatry and behavioral health programs. We have a sweep wellness center, cardiopulmonary rehabilitation, and an expanded walk-in clinic at Anacortes Family Medicine, just to name a few. Our medical arts pavilion includes an expanded cancer care center, a wound care treatment center with state-of-the-art hyperbaric chambers and physical therapy. We remain the largest employer in Anacortes and the only hospital in the region to date without layoffs. Providing quality health care at an affordable cost in today's environment is tremendously challenging. I am deeply committed to our community's health care future. With increased pressure on health care providers, I will explore every option with smart planning, long-term vision for the future, and above all, practice fiscal responsibility essential to maintain a health care provider based on the needs of our community that will continue to thrive. Great, thank you. Um, the first question is, how has the competition for health care services affected the day-to-day -day operations of Island Hospital? Could you, I could hear almost all of that. All right. It was just a little okay. muffled. How is the... How, how has competition for health care services mm -hmm. affected the day-to-day -day operations of Hi Island Hospital? Affected the day-to-day -day operations of Island Hospital. I don't see that it does affect the um, day-to-day operations of Island Hospital. In some cases, I don't see us as having a lot of competition. Our, we are among the highest quality health care providers in the region. We're the lowest cost health care provider in the region. And we constantly monitor what is available elsewhere. We would like to believe that our people in Anacortes realize that the finest care they can get is right here in town. They don't have to drive 15 miles one way or 15 miles another or 40 miles another or go to Seattle to get better cancer care. The same drugs used in cancer treatment in Seattle is used right here in Anacortes. Great, thank you. The second question is a bit of a little bit of a two-part question, but uh, it's what impact have you made in your time on the commission, and what are your priorities moving forward? I'm, I'm I apologize, but it's the sound coming to me is just not real clear. Could you please repeat? Yeah, that? I'll try to project maybe without the microphone. It's echoing so loud I can only hear parts of the sentence. All right, how's that? Better. Okay. What impact have you made in your time on the commission and what are your priorities moving forward? My priorities moving forward. My, personally, I can answer that and it probably is gonna go south here a little bit, but I would like to be, see a comprehensive diabetes treatment center available. We have a number, as I listed a number of the programs that we offer already. I think what we need to do is, as a commissioner of 12 years, looking to spend another six years on the commission, we need to consider all the chronic diseases that are prior in our community, and we need to be able to treat those. Uh, funding uh, would be important, obviously, but I'm looking at personally standing behind a diabetes, a comprehensive diabetes treatment center, so a person that's a diabetic doesn't have to go from doctor to doctor, from treatment to treatment, they can get go one place and be uh, cared for completely. Great, thank you. Um, the third question is, do you think revisiting the question of affiliation for Island Hospital is necessary? 
affiliation, the affiliation question has been one that's been important for a number of years. We keep it, if I say, in the back of our minds. We are always looking at it. But our experience, as Vince mentioned, over the last five years when we looked at it originally, we did not get a lot of community support when it came to should we affiliate. People in our community wanted us to stay autonomous as long as possible. We continue to keep it in the back of our minds while we reach out to various entities like our uh, collaboration with the University of Washington. We have a telestroke program with Swedish Hospital. Uh, we do our recruiting with Providence. We're able to pick and choose what we want to use to provide the highest quality care at the continued lowest cost and at the same time time be able to stay in charge of the way we run our hospital here in our community which is a response to your need great and the final question while I sus um, could you give a much more detailed explanation of what the hospital or as a commissioner in your case had in mind for such a huge expansion of the levy I got the first part would you, a description of a more detailed yeah um, a, a more detailed explanation of what the hospital commission had in mind for such a huge expansion of the levy. Why? I I'm just reading the questions as I've got them here. So uh, could you explain uh, in detail about the, the commissioners deciding on the levy on the amount of the levy? Cor correct. Why, why such a huge expansion? Why such a large increase in the levy amount? I'm going to answer basically the way I can from this point. We had a lot of discussion about the amount of money that we would request from the levy. Um, we could uh, request up to 75 cents per thousand dollar assessed valuation. We chose to stay at the 31 cent level because we feel we, we as a hospital are part of this community. Uh, by that I mean the library has issues, the schools have issues, uh, they need money. It's, we're a community, we work together. And this is a community hospital. Now, we need your support on this levy. Um, if it doesn't pass, we'll move on. We'll carry on. But at the same time, having it pass will make it so much easier to do business and increase the state-of-the-art uh, equipment that we're using, especially the electronic medical record, which will mean a lot to all of you in the community. Great. Thank you for uh, taking some tough questions and dealing with the acoustics. Let's give Jan a big round of applause Thanks. for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jan. We're going to take a moment to switch over the dais and we'll have the Port Commission come up. So ladies and gentlemen on the dais, I want you to get your mouths right next to the microphone because we are filming this and I know that there's times it's hard to hear a little bit in this room and our moderators are going to do what they can to make sure you can hear and I'm working with the gentleman upstairs on that issue right now as well. So Mr. Easton, you're up. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for volunteering to uh, be here today, but also to, to put your name on the ballot. That's quite a, it's quite a step in your life, so congratulations. Um, we're going to start with opening statements. Uh, we'll start 
with Ken and we'll work our way down and then we will start the questions after the opening statements. Ken? Okay, thank you. Um, my name's Ken Goodwin. I'm running for position one with Port of Anacortes. You think about the requirements to be a commissioner and in the state it doesn't take much. But to be an effective commissioner, if you have some background that uh, indicates that you've been a leader and that you've had experiences in the areas that the port's involved in, I think that you're, you can demonstrate that you'd be a better candidate. Uh, my background is I was a commissioner at the Woodenville Water District for 17 years and served with distinction there and received awards from uh, some of my fellow commissioners and also the others in the industry. I served on the board of directors of the state association and also on the water and sewer risk management pool for 19 years providing insurance for all of our members. And uh, having done that, you get to see some commissioners do some things that are a little scary and we had to write some checks but it taught me uh, an awful lot about what you can and can't do and things to stay away from. So I bring, I think, a lot of experience uh, as a commissioner. My background educationally is I've got an MBA from the University of Washington, and I've been a CPA in the state for 44 years. I also worked as the uh, director of finance for the Alderwood Water District, the largest water district in the state. And uh, um, in terms of experience uh, with port activities, I've been a, a member of Skyline Marina for over 20 years with my boat, and I'm a member of the board of that association and serves as uh, the operations manager. Uh, I've, got a, I've been in a business in Alaska for uh, 20 years, having a chain of retail stores in remote areas. So I've got business experience, I've got commissioner elected experience, I've got educational experience, I'm considered an expert in budgets, and I, I think I've got all the skills necessary to um, uh, to be an effective uh, uh, commissioner for you. I've also got experience in the community, served on the North Shore School District, uh, levy committees passing them. My time just ended. <laughs> I uh, forgot to mention when I was introducing this panel that uh, Mr. Alan Workman was unable to come this evening. All right, Matt, we'll start. Yep. Check, check. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Clear. Um, I've been an Anacortes resident for six whole years now. Um, recently purchased my second house, and uh, both of my, my beautiful daughters were delivered here at Island Hospital. Um, thank you guys for that. But um, I say this not merely for introductory purposes. Um, I say it to show my dedication and commitment to the city of Anacortes. Um, I couldn't think of a better place to call home. I may be the youngest candidate running for port commissioner, but I look at that as a strength and an opportunity. Um, I'm 29 years old, but I was a general manager at a hotel and a uh, restaurant here in town at the age of 23. Um, I believe it's time for some fresh ideas and someone to represent my generation when planning and implementing port projects. My skill set is, is pretty different from every other candidate here on this board. I've spent my entire professional career in hospitality and tourism, mainly focusing in on marketing and technology. These skills can be translated into fostering economic growth by expanding the amount of visitors, attracting new businesses, and most importantly, retaining existing businesses. I'm a pro-business candidate, willing to do whatever it takes to ensure that the Port of Anacortes continues to maintain world-class facilities. I believe that infrastructure improvements are the cornerstone to maintaining the port's first tenet of the mission statement. Thank you, Stephanie, Representative Morris, Mr. Easton, the Chamber of Commerce, and all of you for coming out to support. I look forward to fielding questions and, uh, and earning your vote. Thank you, Matt and John. Go ahead. All right, good evening. Thank you all for taking your time to come out here and listen to us tonight. My name is John Petrich. I'm running for Port Commissioner Position 2. I'm a graduate of Anacortes High School and I've been a member of this community for the majority of my life. The duty and honor of public service was instilled in me in a, at a very young age and I'm excited about the prospect of working for you. With my degrees in finance and economics along with over 10 years in the maritime industry, this position is a perfect fit for, for me. 
If elected, I'll bring a fresh perspective to the port and help guide us into the future. I will expand upon the relationships that I already have with members of city council, both sitting and incoming, so that we may better work on projects together that will be mutually beneficial for not only the port, but the city and the community as a whole. I have a vision that the port will soon become a leader amongst ports in Washington in regards to in, um, energy conservation while exploring the feasibility of solar production. Come November 7th, I hope that I've earned your vote of trust and confidence, and I thank you again. Thank you, John. Bill? Okay. Uh, my name's Bill Short. Bill, I'm going to have you put the microphone this close to your mouth. I'm over here. Yeah. Hold the mic a little closer. It was on. You just need to pull it closer to your mouth. Is it on? Yep. There you go. Okay. My name is Bill Short. Uh, I'm running for the uh, term of uh, District 2. Uh, I've been a commissioner now for four uh, terms. Uh, my other professional experience has been um, uh, business economics instructor for Eastern Oregon State College, restaurant owner and operator, and a stockbroker for 18 years. Uh, education is a BBA and an MBA in business administration. Uh, community service, uh, I think, is important. Uh, I'm a new Kiwanis thrift store captain. Uh, been a past Commodore for the Anacortes Yacht Club and also um, a member of the Small Boat uh, Center. Uh, as, besides the family wage jobs that are needed in this town, environmental clean ex cleanup, I believe that Cap Sandy Marine off Marina offers the best opportunity for economic uh, benefit for Anacortes. Uh, we have uh, the first we are first in the Puget Sound for transient boat, uh, boats coming to our uh, marina. And this is a time when uh, other marinas are charging half as much as we do. Uh, but we are very successful in, uh, especially with the party floats that came in, um, getting uh, rendezvous coming in, and hopefully we can uh, have enough revenue to keep taxes low and uh, the um, uh, jobs uh, we need in town. So uh, wish, wish to have your vote. My name is Bill Short. Thank you, Bill. Shane, your opening statement. Best test. All right, let me do a sound check on our vote. The, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Shane Aggergaard. I see a lot of familiar faces out there, and uh, selling myself is probably not uh, my strongest suit. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, again, my name is Shane Aggergaard. I'm running for District 5, and uh, I own Island Adventures Whale Watching here in Anacortes. And we started that, when I say we, I mean my wife Jennifer and I. Uh, we got a couple kids, a couple dogs. Uh, grew up in Anacortes, lived here since I was three left during the college years, um, came back to Anacortes in 1996. Uh, since then, Island Adventures has gone from a couple kids with an old wooden fish boat, I think Kathy actually wrote us our first lease at the port, to the largest whale watch company in Washington State. We now run out of five different locations. We have three boats that are 100 plus passengers. We have 40 employees. We have constantly changed uh, how we do things um, over the years uh, in the best interest of our customers. Running for port commissioner is something that I've always wanted to do. This is a good time for me. Uh, we've gone through a big expansion at work over the next couple of years. I'll have time to devote to the position. Um, my skill set is unique. I'm more of a, a visionary. I like to create things. I like to see things through. I like to create amazing things. And this community means a lot to me. So as a port commissioner, this is a perfect fit, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to do that. Anybody who's run their own small business knows that they wear a lot of different hats, from boat maintenance, uh, marketing, uh, we have uh, managing staff. Um, you gotta be a business person, a whale person, and a boat person, I think I'm all three. But I'm also a big community person. This, uh, I'm very excited for the opportunity. 
uh, to run for port commissioner. This is new to me, but uh, very excited for the opportunity and I appreciate uh, your vote and your support. Thank you, Shane. Kathy, your opening statement. Thank you, Stephanie and the Chamber of Commerce for providing this forum. Thanks to the city for hosting this venue and our moderators for taking the time to do this tonight. To all those in the audience, thank you for taking the time to be involved in our community. My name is Kathy Pittis and I'm running for Port of Anacortes Commission seat number five. I believe my history advocating for the Port of Anacortes, its customers and tenants over the years demonstrates my commitment to this community and to this position. This is a natural extension of my dedication to the Port of Anacortes and to community service. I believe I can help advance a healthy environment at the Port of Anacortes that stimulates economic development, job creation, and commerce. I am committed to the port's mission, and my long history with the port enables me to hit the ground running. I bring a diversified pr perspective with over 21 years advocating for uh, commission in in initiatives. I have confidence that you can balance economics with it, environmental um, stewardship. And I want to cultivate that for our community, our kids, and our grandkids as well. I look forward to serving the Port of Anacortes and would be honored to be the first commissioner. I will represent our res residents when they, in, in their values of quality of life, needs, and desires that makes our community such an amazing place to work, live, and recreate in. If elected, I would look forward to represent this port and advance the port, just as I have always have done. I would just be wearing a different hat. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Kathy. All right, so take a deep breath. This is where it's gonna get interesting. We have uh, five to six questions and we have one minute answers. So you'll need to be um, paying close attention to the question, but if you need it repeated, I will do that. And the first question we're gonna start with is multi-part. So we're not, gonna, we're not gonna ease into this. We're jumping into the pool. So. And this is a prioritization question, and I'm going to give you a list of projects, and you're going to need to talk about how you would prioritize those. All right. Are there plans for development and optimization of each of the port's properties? Specifically, the, I'm sorry, we're starting with Matt. I should, oh, I should have made that clear. Great. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll start there. Are there plans for development and optimization of each port property? Specifically, the North Basin Project? the parking lot areas of the Marine Technical Center, and the greater airport properties beyond a couple of hangars. Matt, how would you prioritize the development of these properties and move them forward? That's a, good, that's a great question. Um, as far as the priorities go, um, the North Basin is a, is a, is a pretty important project, um, as well as parking over at the, the Marine Technical Center, I believe more can be done with the, um, the gravel lots that are currently there to improve that. Um, so as far as priorities go, I would say um, North Basin, uh, the, uh, the, the lots over at the Technical Center, and then the airport. Thank you. Next, John. If you'd like me to repeat the question, any of you can ask me for that, but I'll just let you start, John. No, I'm good. Um, I believe from the people that I have talked to in the community and people that are holding elected offices right now, that the North Basin should be number one priority. Um, there, there's a lot of good potential there. Uh, there some, some good prospects of linking up the downtown, the depot area, and potentially expanding into uh, the North Basin to have open venues, uh, potentially um, real estate you know, expansion. And uh, so I, I would put the North Basin first. Uh, parking lot, parking is always an issue around here. And then airport optimization. Thank you, John. Bill? Uh, is um, probably the best place to be developing uh, here again, developing, we're working together with the city, uh, developing the depot uh, port complex and part of that is the development of a multi-purpose building that would take the place of the transit shed which uh, is in questionable uh, condition. Uh, the other uh, places uh, 
we need to uh, possibly put some retail down uh, uh, along the edge of the uh, parking lots there at the uh, school uh, on the uh, north end of that lot. And the other thing I want to caution people about is we constantly are getting uh, real estate people want to put condos on port property and I definitely against any condos on port property. Thank you, Bill. Shane? Okay. We um, I kind of like the transit shed, actually. Um, as a port commissioner, I would look at all options to keep that viable and feasible. Uh, I would like to also look at the North Basin to see what the best direction to go is. I know there's been extensive effort at comp plans and to see what's going to be best for the community and how it ties into the downtown area and how it supports the businesses downtown and in and around the marina. I think the focus needs to be finishing what we started with the marina. A dock needs to be replaced. It needs to be on the fast track. Regarding the parking around A dock, which was part of the question, I had to get my plug for A dock in. Um, but the parking around it, if you don't have parking, you don't have supporting businesses there. Um, so to market that parking to do anything else other than parking is a mistake. We don't have enough parking as it is with the boat trailer launch that's being in there in the summer, plus the tour boat parking, plus be people able to recreate at the beautiful uh, park that was created there. It's just also very important. Thank you, Shane. Kathy? If, if you're not using your microphones, could you turn them off so we don't hear you breathing? <laughs> so the land around the marina it, there isn't much left, so a lot of discernment and contemplation needs to happen about those last upland pieces. So community involvement is really important. That's why you have things like comprehensive plans and meetings. The other thing is that you also have the CIP, which is something capital improvement project that the staff uses to prioritize projects, and that's large and small projects as well. So obviously input from the community is really important. I think most people here know that there is talk about an event center in the north end. That's still going through feasibility. What that means financially, what that means as far as operationally, and, and all those pieces need to come in. Um, and again, a thoughtful process as to what we have with what's left. North Basin, yes, it's a very important piece. And it ties so much into the community. The airport, a very important piece. Another one that we need to keep this facility that has been providing um, this community since 1969 facilities. Thank you, Kathy. All right, so the first, this second question will now first go to John and we'll continue the rotation. This gives you a chance to follow up on your, your answers about the North Basin. The port has been through several consulting contracts and redesign phases of the Cap Sani Marina North Basin. To this date, no action has occurred. What do you believe is the best use of the property for economic development and the community, and how would you prioritize? Um, <clears throat> I need a point of order. We ended with Kathy, but Ken didn't answer that first question. And I just understood what he was trying to sign language me. So All right. Ken, Ken gets to answer Ken, would, that. Would you like me to restate the question? All right. So the first question, are there plans for development and optimization of each port property? specifically the North Basin, parking lot areas at the Marine Technical Center, and the greater airport properties beyond a couple of hangars. How would you prioritize the development of these properties? Okay, thank you. I thought I'd get a pass on that one. But, uh, <laughs> I'd be no glad to, to deal with it. Well, I, I would hope that the port can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think all these projects uh, should get attention and probably are. That's the way uh, most capital funding projects work is that the they're all moving forward at, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, some faster than others. Uh, it sounds like there's uh, uh, unanimous consent that the North Basin ought to be developed. I agree with that. The transit shed uh, is not a place uh, that we should be using for uh, community events. Uh, we need that other one at the North Basin. The, um, the transit shed needs to be down uh, and utilized by the uh, marine terminal uh, businesses. Uh, the airport, uh, uh, of course, is, a, is, is a, an important port project or, or asset, but uh, my feeling is it should be kept small, quiet, and safe, and uh, it not necessarily a priority for anything. And funding is going to be the driver on all projects. All right. John? I'm going to repeat the question. 
The port has been through several consulting contracts and redesign phases at the Cap Sani Nor Marina North Basin. To this date, no action has occurred. What do you believe is the best use of the property for economic development and the community, and how would you prioritize? Yes, well, uh, first off, I think that the port, as always, needs to be responsive to the community, both the general public and the private sector, and continue fielding their inputs of what they feel is the best priority. My best priority, or how I would prioritize it, might not line up with the community. So that's where I need to reach out to members, ask them again, is this something that you really want to do, this comp plan? I personally think it's a great idea. Um, there, there seems to be a consensus to connect the downtown area and the depot area to the North Basin, and that comp plan seems to address that in a good, in a good direction. But again, you know, it, it, it's up for the public to voice their opinion and tell us which direction to go. Thank you, John. Bill? Uh, dealing with, uh, first of all, the airport, uh, we have a situation of aging pilots, aging airplanes, and the cost of flying extremely high, and so we're not seeing any much growth there. But there is a very ne much needed uh, case for having the airport because we've got 12 airports out in the islands that uh, count on using the airport. Uh, North Basin, uh, first of all, we have a lot, uh, a lot of boats there. We need parking for the boats. And if anything, we need a little more paved parking because it gets awfully dusty there. Uh, secondly, uh, at the moment, we've been using uh, it for trailers, and trailers are a good investment uh, because they return a high rate of return for a low capital investment. Thank you, Bill. Shane, would you like me to repeat the question? All right, go ahead. Okay, the North Basin. Uh, I think we can do a lot by starting off with a bit of a cleanup, making it um, that upper lot a little bit more attractive, making it a little bit more park-like without spending a lot of money on development. I think uh, we do need the parking there. Um, I would like to l really look as a commissioner talking to the community on what type of events would be used in this facility over the long term to really see how big it needs to be, how expensive it needs to be, and what the best use of the land is. So that is something that, um, as far as the North Basin, that I would really jump into right now. I think the priority needs to be on the South Basin finishing ADOC. If we don't take care of our existing tenants, we will lose them. And that is a strong possibility. So we have to take care of the tenants that we have before we grow into the North Basin. I think there's work to be done there. Shane, Kathy? So in regards to what looks like inaction for the North Basin comp plan, and understanding that that comp plan, when it was put together, the financial pieces and the operational pieces were not yet um, integrated into that plan. Then what ended up happening is you probably heard about the hotel and that there was a, a contemplation of a hotel going there. And that did put the plan on hold for a while because that needed to be explored. It's not that it's dead. Uh, but it's not at moving forward at this point. The parties are taking a, a break at this point in time. If I got that right, please correct me if I'm wrong. So what looks like in action is that there needed to be, again, a thoughtful process as to the last pieces of property surrounding the marina. And the hotel, yes, did delay some of that. The plan is not that old. I think we're talking three years old. So um, I, I would say that there's, it's not that there's not in action. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, I think that the, uh, the North Basin project ought to move forward. Uh, I can't imagine anything nicer than walking in front of Anthony's and then continuing north and walking around the marina and uh, looking at those boats. It's going to definitely bring in uh, more tourist dollars, and, and I think when the people come and that's built, that it'll bring in more businesses that will be friendly for, for that area. Uh, again, everything is driven by a financial plan, and uh, the port has got to 
a comprehensive plan that they've uh, identified in terms of what they want to do for it. And uh, it, it just needs to move forward at a some kind of a pace. But again, the, the finances are going to have to dictate it. And uh, my colleague is absolutely right. Uh, there are a lot of demands on port money. And ADOC's a big one, and the TDOC. So uh, the priority is not just one item. They have to look at uh, many projects that uh, are facing the port. And there's no really easy answer. But uh, the studies need to continue on again. They can walk and chew gum at the same time. They're going to be looking at a number of different things. Thank you, Ken. Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that with, you know, the, the, the thought of, you know, hotel going in there, the, the public-private partnerships can be, can be straining. So maintaining that property as, as port property is, is pretty important. Um, I'm going to piggyback off of uh, both John and, and, and Shane in, in, in saying that it's, it's my job to represent you guys as to what you would like to see as the North Basin. Um, it's definitely important that we, that we address that and look at improving infrastructure that we currently have, um, especially ADOC. But, um, but yeah, we'd love to, love to hear from you. Thank you. All right, for your next question. We'll start with Bill. What is your take on the potential conflict between income producing and public benefit projects on port owned properties? To begin with, uh, ports were established to be ec uh, economic developers uh, f and also to protect the waterfront from uh, monopolies like railroads when they were first established. But I believe that w we work hand in hand with the um, city, for instance. Uh, we're getting a lot of transient boaters in, currently the most popular uh, port or uh, marina in the state, uh, contributing uh, close to a million dollars additional income than we did a few years ago. We, from what I can figure from figures, we're looking at about $3 million in funds that are not going for dock fees but um, uh, or fuel, but going to uh, Anacor's businesses, and that's a big shot in the arm. Thank you, Bill. Shane, ready to repeat the question? Yes. Okay. Uh, what is your take on the potential conflict between income producing and public benefit projects on port owned properties? One more time. I'm sorry. What, what is your take on the potential conflict between income producing and public benefit projects on port owned properties? Income producing projects. I'm still not sure I fully get where you're going. I, it'd be nice to have an example of that. I know I only have a minute here, but income producing as in small businesses working inside the marina, like yacht brokers, commercial fishermen, every single commercial fisherman is its own private business. Uh, the, you know, whether it's a tour boat, um, you know, MSRC, all the working boats in the marina, I'm not sure if that's where you're going as far as income producing property, but as far as the um, public, like uh, music concerts, uh, things like that. So I don't fully understand where the question was pretty vague to me. I, maybe I, I just didn't quite get it. So, so I'm, I'm reading the questions. I'm not designing them. So, and, and, uh, I'm, and I'm just saying I want to answer the question to the best of my sure. ability. I believe in small business inside the port. It's good for economic development. And that is um, a big part of my candidacy is I definitely want to see the port move forward, the community move forward and support small businesses. Um, but at the same time, supporting the uh, community as a whole. Thank you. Kathy. Sorry, so income producing, so you have things like the marine terminals, which provide a lot of income to the Port of Anacortes and then out to the community through economic development and job creation. You have land leases, upland land leases that bring in not only um, revenues to the Port of Anacortes, but provide a number of jobs to this community. On the flip side, when you talk about 
public benefit, they go hand in hand. A marina is a good example of that. You can have a marina, but if you don't have the upland amenities and things like an esplanade and a beautiful park and, and everything that uh, boaters and users want, then you don't have a good um, marina. And then what happens from that, though? It keeps going in a circle. You have the transient moorage, and the transient moorage survey brings in about $9 million a year into this community. So you have economic development and public benefit at the same time. Thank you, Kathy. Ken? Yeah, the, the legislature established ports for a pretty specific purpose, and it was to develop uh, the commerce and to create uh, jobs. So that ought to be the primary focus of, of the port. It doesn't mean you can't have an answer like benefit of, uh, to the public in terms of how they do it, but I think the primary mission ought to be to uh, increase commerce, build businesses, and uh, bring jobs into the port. Thank you, Ken. Matt. Perfect. Yeah, I, I believe there's a, there's, there's a fine balance between the two. Uh, the, the Port of Anacortes uh, mission statement, the first tenant is to foster economic development, and that's what needs to happen. You know, we've got some pretty incredible facilities already for the public. Um, Seafarers Memorial Park is absolutely beautiful. Um, but to improve infrastructure to be able to accommodate, you know, more tour vessels, um, more transient moorage, really upgrade those facilities, I think, is, a, is an absolute priority. Great. Thank you. John? Yeah, so there, there's talk amongst us about, you know, economic development being a priority, and that is the first tenant of the port. But a second tenant of it, is also to improve the community. So in my opinion, there really shouldn't be a conflict when we're weighing uh, options between income producing projects and projects designed for the public. You know, they, they should be analyzed on a case by case basis and seeing which would give the better <coughs> benefit. If planned correctly, uh, a public orientated project could equate to more income for the community uh, surrounding businesses and vice versa. A, a good project that was designed to stimulate economic development could make a betterment for the community also. Thank you, John. All right, new question. Uh, the first one will answer will come from Shane. And here's your question. As a good neighbor, what do you think the best use of the privately owned property east of the cannery and west of Seafares is? We're talking about the sand lot between, yep, okay. Um, I would like to see retail and condos. I know that hasn't been popular. Um, I think it's a beautiful location. I think it could be tastefully done. I know that has met some resistance there, but I would not be opposed to looking at a good solid tenant. I am not a big advocate of public-private partnerships. I feel if the port thought it was profitable, I would like to see the port in full control of that property. So that is a tough one. Uh, I would definitely be listening to the community on that one, but I am not opposed to land use that draws people to that specific area. Seafarers Park is beautiful. Uh, that side of the marina is definitely seeing a lot more activity. And I think if the port could benefit and the community could benefit from retail space, bathroom space, but we have to protect the parking in that area as well. Thank you, Shane. Kathy? I'm cautious because it's not under Port of Anacortes jurisdiction, so it is a, a privately owned piece of property. Again, there will be whatever uses out there, there will be public process through that if it's not in accordance to zoning regulations as well. So um, with that, I would say the public needs to be involved. It's not just the Port of Anacortes. It's we are a neighbor and we have input into that. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough, there's only so much land left around, and you want to have non-competing and but complementary pieces as well. So all that is a part of the what you look at, what will bring in, and our port's priority, yes it is, economic development and job creation and commerce. So that would be a lens to look through, and then obviously the wants, needs, and desires of our community. 
Thank you, Kathy. Ken? Yeah, I think she touched on it. This, this is one where the community should be involved in terms of what they think would be uh, the best and serve them uh, and the port. Uh, again, everything the port needs to focus on has to be for creating jobs and uh, developing commerce in the area, but uh, that's, that can be done with the uh, community's input. And uh, uh, it, it, I don't think public-private partnerships are necessarily bad. They just have to look, be looked at individually on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there can be some real benefits uh, associated with them. Thank you, Ken. Matt? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with uh, Ken and, and, and defer to uh, the voters and the people that I'm representing. It's important for um, for, for you guys to, to have your say. Um, I would be um, for retail and, and, and development there. Um, I think it's a, it's a good potential to be able to um, expand and, and bring more people to the area, which is, which is the point. So um, I'd, be, I'd be in favor of that. Thank you, Matt. John? Well, first I have to say that I'm, I'm very pleased to hear uh, so many of the candidates up here saying that we need to defer a lot of this to the public because that really is our position to represent the public and I, I'm glad to hear that. I've talked to both sides uh, of this issue and I would like to better understand both sides of the issue. I've heard good arguments for, I've heard good arguments against, but obviously we need to come to the table, talk about it more, and see, hey, maybe there's a third option. Maybe there's a fourth option. Things that we haven't thought about yet that this piece of real estate could be best utilized for. Possibly go to the public, like Matt and Ken have said, do another comprehensive plan, and go from there. Thank you, John. Bill? I'm in favor of a multi-use uh, building but a hotel, not a condo. And the reason is that if it's a hotel, you're dealing with one owner versus possibly 14 owners. And uh, part of the problem we've had in other locations, and you have owners near uh, public sites, uh, they're constantly giving you a bad time. A person coming into a hotel, they're there for a night or two, then they're gone. The second thing that I'm in favor of is that this is complementary, actually, to the whale watch boat because the people would come in and stay there and they'd be close to the boats that they're going out on, so it would be a real asset. And then the other thing that um, comes to mind is I'm afraid that the cannery building next to it isn't all that successful, and if it went it might become a condo, what I'm worried about. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. Start with Kathy. Do you support the increase in vessel traffic and size, for instance, bringing the Panamax as a positive move for the port of Anacortes? I do. What we need to do is make sure our infrastructure is taken care of for our marine terminals. Marine terminals typically are a backbone of ports around the state, and we need to be poised as far as knowing what our future is. Some of those future um, needs and desires of our customers are going to be best known by some people in that industry. So whether it be our longshoremen, whether it be people that are in the Northwest Marine Terminal Association, our counterparts, finding what makes us competitive and keeping us um, poised to be able to do that in the future is extremely important. Dredging is important. Maintaining our facilities is important. Thank you, Kathy. Ken. Uh, yeah, there's there's some things in the plan already to uh, to dredge, uh, make it a little deeper there, and to uh, f fix up the bulkheads. And that needs to be done. We need to keep the people we have. As far as attracting uh, new customers, the more we can do, the better. It's not an easy thing to do, but. Uh, but we also have to be cautious of some other things. We have some, and nobody's mentioned it yet, but we have some environmental issues that need to be taken care of. And uh, there's about 30-some million dollars on the books of the port for environmental cleanup. Now, they've done a good job in the past of getting the responsible parties and the insurance companies involved in the state and the feds to get money for that. But those things need to be done, or we're not going to be attracting people because we're not going to look like a first-class port. Thank you, Ken. Matt. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely support uh, bringing in, you know, larger vessels. Um, bigger boats means uh, bigger potential for economic economic development and more money spent in Anacortes, um, which is which is the main goal. Um, so, so yeah, bring it on for sure. Thank you, Matt. John. Yeah, I'm also in agreement. Uh, we're one of what eight deep water ports in the region. And we need to stay flexible to all options, uh, especially when we're planning for the future. We want to keep competitive so that we can get contracts that we might not have or might go upstream or downstream. We want to keep people, ILWU workers, on the ground working and increase our labor force instead of decreasing it. And in order to do that, we need to stay competitive. And to link up with that, you know, th this is a time when we should be looking for a marine terminal manager that has a background in marketing so that we can say, hey, where are these options? And let's try to attract those businesses here. Thank you, John. Bill. Uh, I believe that sh well, ships are getting larger and uh, they're also taking more drafts. Sometimes ships uh, we have to can't fill them up completely because the, they might be sitting on the bottom or um, the bigger ships just don't come in. We're looking for smaller ones. The um, as far as uh, t products, sulfur and uh, coke seem to be the two main things that I see. I, the only other th item that may be in the future would, that I've seen being exported it would be wood chips, but that's uh, just a chance that because we have a large sawmill nearby. Thank you, Bill. Shane. Well, I know uh, Anacorda was rocking right along there for a little while. It's one more export there. Funny, I drive a tour boat for a living. Lots of rocks were loaded off of the pier. Um, I would really look hard at that project because I do know the dredging is not as simple as that. The pilings will also need to be replaced. So I would look at the cost of that fixing pier two, as well as the money that's brought in from the bigger ships. We may have a real unique market with the smaller boats. I think it's massively inefficient to load them halfway, have them leave and go to the competition. I know that we are going to drop uh, our petro coke by about half this year is what's kind of expected. And if we don't have the facilities to compete, uh, but I really want, I, as a commissioner, I would dig deep into that project to see what it's going to cost to do the dredging, replace the pilings, and what the end result is gonna be for revenue for the port. Because we do need to remain competitive, but also solvent and not get into too big of projects. Thank you, Shane. So the bonus question. We're gonna go off script a little bit. I think Ken touched on something that hasn't been brought up and so I think it would be good for us to discuss issues around cleanup. So take one minute to describe what you would prioritize as it relates to cleanup projects in the area. And we'll start with uh, Ken. Uh, I'd, I'd start down there um, next to Randy's with that, uh, that log uh, cleanup that, that's there. Um, all, both sites, that one and the um, um, the fuel site, are going to have a significant amount of funds coming from the insurance companies and from the responsible parties. They never get away from that. I don't care if they sell it or whatever they do. Uh, the ones, the people that did the polluting, are going to end up uh, writing checks. And the port has done an excellent job. I have to commend them in the past for. Uh, getting some $60 million to do other cleanup projects. And uh, that's, we just got to uh, continue doing it. And uh, if if we look like a first class port, we're going to bring people in and it'll be a lot easier than to have the economic development. Thank you. Matt? I think with the addition of cleanup, um, I think we should also, um, as the Port of Anacortes, look into renewable energies um, for both the uh, facilities and whatever we can do to make sure that we are um, we're, we're leading the industry in, in renewable energies. Thank you, Matt. John? 
Yeah, the current commission uh, has made great strides in the Clean Clo Cove uh, cleanup project. They, they have a responsible party that is uh, planning on footing their share of the bill. So we need to go forward with that. The, the, it's already in motion and continue. The log pocket there over by Terminal 2, I think if that was cleaned up properly, it could be another potential revenue source if we look at potentially moorage for tugboats coming into that area. And what Matt said, uh, I, I agree with him with looking into renewable energy sources and also just seeing what the port can do to lower its own carbon footprint as a leader and to show other, other municipalities, other cities that it can be done. Bill? Um, we have a couple of uh, cleanup sites at Dakota Creek that need to be attended to. Uh, we have uh, some cleanup at uh, Secret uh, Cove as we need to um, get with the uh, polluters to get them to pay for part of the bill and the EPA will pay the other half pretty much. And also problems with the uh, log pocket. And one that uh, could be a future problem that we're looking into now is the replacement of the fuel tanks up at the airport. If we don't get that done, we could have some problems down the road. Thank you, Bill. Shane? Yeah, obviously the uh, cleanup has been very successful uh, that's been done over the past few years. That should continue where funding allows and to identify the individual projects. But one of the things that... Um, I do believe in that, uh, you know, if you if you want to get out of a hole, you better quit digging for a while. And we have some cleanup that we could do in the marina. As far as an active tenant in the marina, I believe that we should offer uh, the ability to, we do uh, recycled oil, but we need to do antifreeze as well. There is a potential for vessels to potentially pump antifreeze into our harbor, and I know that there's a strong possibility that that happens. If they were able to uh, recycle that for free even if it was at port cost it's not going to go in the water we're not going to deal with it in future generations so there's things that we can do to actively stop contaminants from happening at the same time we focus on cleaning things up thank you Shane Kathy I'm going to read from my excerpt out of the Anacor's Chamber of Commerce um, survey that was done so I would encourage everyone to look at those surveys to get more detail from everybody that's sitting up here. So dredging, yes, is an important issue, not only for the marine terminal, but for the marina. But it makes, in this environment right now, it makes it financially infe not feasible to do um, without help to do that. It's also another reason why you need commissioners that can work with state legislators and people like Washington Public Ports Association to make sure that funding is in place. The two initiatives for the port right now for 2017 are the Quiet Cove site and the log haul out. Both of those started well before 2017 and will continue well into the future, which is not unusual for em environmental projects. Um, with that, however, is you also have shorter term projects that can happen, like the pump out barge that is slated to happen over at log at the log haul out. Thank you. Would you please join me in, in uh, thanking the candidates for port commission? <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, it's the dedication that you give to your time and your talents for civic engagement is really appreciated. So we'll be switching over the dais for the city council and we'll invite them up. Thanks.
How's this? Okay. You were asking if you could be heard. Yeah, you were fine. All right, thank you everyone um, for being patient during our turnover. Um, and great job, Jason, on that moderation. That's a hard job. Jeff, for you're up for it, I know it. I know you can do this. So um, Jeff, you take it over. Great, thank you. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for choosing uh, to, to pursue public service. Uh, sometimes it's the hardest times where the best people need to step up. And I appreciate you all putting your neck out there for, for this. The, the, the uh, format's gonna be a two minute opening statement and then we're gonna have six questions. We're gonna use the same format you saw before. Each person will have a chance to answer a question first. Um, if you can't hear the question or if my rare pre-cable anacortis accent throws you off, uh, please ask me to repeat the question and I will happily do that. So to start off uh, with the opening statement, uh, I guess, Sarah. Thank you, Chamber, and thank you all the members of the community and the audience. My name is Sarah Hollihan. I'm running for City Council, position four. I am passionate about this community. I first moved here in the 1980s. I've now lived here 17 years. I came back because I love the charm, I love the waterfront, and I love the friendly people. Two of my three children graduated from high school here. And they benefited from more than just great schools. They had a caring community, whether it was the Kiwanis or the community theater, and I'm grateful for that support. I started volunteering in the schools, and I was asked to uh, serve on the PTA. And I said, sure. And next thing I knew, I was co-president of the high school PTSA for two years. And that was a great experience. And I kept volunteering with soccer and friends of the library in the Anacortes Community Garden. I love helping people and I love helping the environment. The environment is so important. Anacortes has a bounty of natural resources and we must protect it. We're doing a really great job with the forest lands, but we can do more. We can bring that throughout the city, whether it's sustainable street tree program, more connectivity, Oh, 30 seconds. Hmm. Um, we are growing so fast. It is essential that the city council oversees well-planned development. I've gone to a lot of council meetings. I've talked to neighbors from Skyline to Old Town, and they are concerned about impacts that are changing their neighborhood. And I think it's really important that we have housing for all levels my background is in teaching and librarianship. I work for the city of Mount Vernon, so I know about city government. I want to serve you, I want to listen to you, and please consider voting for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie, and the uh, chamber membership for inviting us here tonight, and uh, to the moderators, appreciate it. Uh, thanks also to those of you who took time out of your busy schedules to be here. I know it can be uh, I know you can tune in on Monday nights for council meetings and see me, but I appreciate the opportunity to reintroduce myself. And speaking of busy schedules, I also uh, know that many of us chamber members are, will have a busy weekend, so good luck at Shipwreck. My name is Matt Miller. I'm running for re-election because I want to continue serving the community where we have raised our kids and started the family business. This community has supported my family and our business during the many times I was overseas serving our country and I've enjoy, I have enjoyed being able to give back to Anacortes. I'm here to answer questions about my vision to Anacortes, about my vision for Anacortes tonight, but my vision is not nearly as important as the visions of those I represent. I think knowing about, more about me and my background and the skills I bring to city council is very important. I've worked my entire career to be inclusive of all views. I have a solution-oriented servant style of leadership. My experience comes from decades of service in the Navy and over a decade as a local business owner and community volunteer. My experience is important because you don't always know what decisions might come before a council in the future, as I've seen this many times on my two years on the Planning Commission and my four years on the council now. I bring real-world independent understanding to solve challenging issues. 
My last military assignment was executive officer of Naval Air Station Whidbey Island, responsible for day-to-day -day operations of one of the busiest air stations in the country with over 10,000 military and civilian personnel. It included not only airport, but police, fire, recreation, and public works departments. I was responsible for efficient resource management and environmental stewardship. I've been a small local brick and mortar business owner for 13 years. I brought that resume to the city and I'd be very comfortable you asking anyone working for our city that my unique background has added value to the city. I want to continue to be your representative and leverage my skills, experience to ensure this community is the most sustainable, livable, and economically vibrant waterfront community in the country. I will continue a collaborative approach with our partners at the port, school district, hospital, and businesses to pursue new opportunities that are compatible with our island community and maritime heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Bruce, good evening. You now control the dais. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you to the chamber for putting on this event and to everyone in the community for coming out to, to see us tonight. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Bruce McDougall, and I'm running for city council position number five. I also happen to be sitting in city council position number five as a couple months ago I had the, the tremendous honor of being appointed to the position by the existing council to fill out the remainder of John Archibald's term. <coughs> So I don't think I'm very well known in the community, so I think some explanation is in order. In order. Uh, I grew up west of Mount Vernon in Skagit Valley, spent a lot of time in Anacortes as a, as a kid. I learned to swim here in the 80s, uh, learned to cliff jump here in the 90s, and then, um, <coughs> then I left the area for basically the last 20 years, went to university, and then embarked on a career in information technology. My career has taken me through stints in Seattle and Portland and Denver, and, uh, and currently my day job is, I, I'm a network engineering consultant to some of the largest internet companies in the world, which is the greatest job in the world in my opinion. Um, <coughs> when my family got to move back here about four years ago, I got involved in the community as a part of the, the Mayor's Citizen Advisory Council. And then I've also been a volunteer consultant to the, to the city on its fiber optic project. So, in the remaining months of John's term and hopefully if elected for the next four years, I wanna try to take on two major projects. I wanna complete the fiber optic project, which is going to deliver high speed, low cost internet service to the community and also be a, an economic development game changer, I believe. The second big issue I wanna try to tackle is, is housing affordability. We have a real challenge here um, to be able to, even for working folks like, like nurses and teachers and, uh, and entrepreneurs to afford a place to live. So I wanna try to find some creative solutions there. Thanks all for coming out. Um, look forward to a great conversation tonight. Thank you, Bruce. John, please proceed with your opening remarks. Uh, thank you all for having us all here out here tonight. It's truly a pleasure to be here in front of so many concerned citizens. Uh, it really is pleasing to me to see how many people came out to see who's going to be legislating your city in the next four years. Um, as a kid growing up in Oak Harbor, Anacortes really only meant two things for me. Uh, first was our annual trips to our eye doctor, Dr. Chambers, over there when I was at the hospital. And second was always the forest lands. My friends and I have spent several weekends and even skipped school more than once just to come over here and go mountain biking, swimming, or hiking in the vast system of trails and lakes. We got to know the island and its trails pretty well back then. I have lived here now going on 20 years. I'm married to an amazing woman. We have two boys, ages four and two. I have been involved in our family business, Secret Cove and Randy's Pier 61 before that for most of the past 15 years. This is a great town to be in business in. However, over the last several years, it has gotten more and more difficult to find and hire staff as many in the service industry have been priced out of town. We have around a dozen full-time year-round employees and five of them commute to, work for, commute to work from places like Oak Harbor, Mount Vernon, and even Conway. I feel we could be putting more energy and time into developing affordable housing projects, um, offering builders or developers some sort of tax or fee relief associated with building in town, or <coughs> certain percentages of, pro excuse me, in the form of tax relief if certain percentages of their projects file under the heading of affordable housing. Uh, I don't want to see the higher end develop stunted or altered by any means. There are some truly magnificent homes all over the island, but if we don't start making more affordable housing options available, the people who work here will no longer be able to live here. This means your favorite server or bartender, your barista, the person who changes your tires or cuts your hair, mows your yard, any of that stuff. Anacortes is our home, and I want my children to be able to afford to live here too. A vote for me is a vote for all of us, everyone who lives here, works here, or plays here, or would like to continue to do so. 
Thank you, John. Uh, Anthony, please proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for joining in and being a part of this wonderful thing that we do called elections and choosing the people that we represent of. Um, my name is Anthony Young. I'm running for city council seat number seven, unopposed. To tell you a little bit about me, for those of you that don't know me, I've got an MBA from Wake Forest University. I was also educated at the University of North Carolina Institute of Government. And I worked in the North Carolina Attorney General's Office, Department of Justice, for many years. I came here, um, I've lived in Anacortes for eight years, but I came here with my spouse of 25 years, Dr. Joseph Mokahi, and he works at Island Hospital. We chose this place after um, just sort of looking where we thought we can build a life together and build a new sense of family. And uh, so we came here and we fell in love with the town. Three words that I think would describe me would be compassionate, fiscally conservative, and honest. I believe integrity and honest are so important. I am simply someone that believes in the word called public servant. It is so not about me, but it's about us and how do we get to what we need to be, who we want to be, and how we want to represent ourselves to the rest of the world. I pledge to you in to put our collective interests first um, as a city. My hope is to ensure that all voices are heard and at the table. And I'd also like to say right now, I'm grateful to Erica Pickett for the legacy that she's um, placed in these shoes that I will fill upon election. I'm honored and humbled by her service of, um, her legacy of service. And what I promised to you I would do is I would give you my best, I will always be honest, and I will look for the best interest of our city and our town as best as I can. Thank you very much, and I please ask for your vote. We have a late breaking news flash from Stephanie Hamilton. No, just to, I, I meant to say that Liz Lovelett um, gave her apologies for being unable to attend tonight. And she just wanted you to know that she's excited about continuing service, but she was not able to be here. Great, thank you. And thank you all for your opening remarks. Uh, as I stated at the beginning, we're going to be rotating. Since Sarah began, we're going to be going to Matt with the first question. And this is a long question. We probably should have had Stephanie's uh, break in in the middle of it to uh, reduce the... Uh, the length of it. The 2016 Comprehensive Plan Goal H3 Housing Availability states provide for a range of housing opportunities to address the needs of all economic segments of the community. The low and middle income workforce element of our community, community consisting of many of our service occupations pay too little to cover rent. They are critical to our economic future and yet they are largely missing from any affordable housing action plans from our city. What change will you advocate to help this working economic segment? That's a, that's a long question. It's, it's something that we've been looking at on council for, for a long time. It's a difficult issue. It's difficult, number one, because uh, you can't legislate, um, uh, you can't legislate house prices. House prices have gone up significantly in Anacortes. I think the latest number, the average house in the past five years has gone from uh, 300,000 to almost 400,000 in Anacortes. Uh, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to legislate. But what you can do is you can set the opportunity for land that is not yet developed, which is another problem with this, this issue. Um, we're running out of land. We are on Fidalgo Island. Um, and and w the problem there is you have, you have to set the table for developers to be able to come in and provide incentives, various tax incentives, to have them develop some affordable housing. It's a serious issue. Uh, we've set up a uh, affordable housing uh, committee on the city council to look at this issue, and it's something that uh, we have to keep working on, and I'm out of time. Great, thank you. Uh, Bruce, would you like me to repeat the question? I think I'm okay. Great. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is an incredibly challenging question. It's, uh, the, the dirt in Anacortes is expensive, and you know, the, the statistics on the, the new building that has been done is actually pretty, it's, it's very skewed toward, toward the high end of the market. Um, <coughs> trying, to, trying to attack both kind of the medium end of the market and the low end of the market is going to be very difficult to, to go after, I think. 
Um, one, of the, one of the programs that I was turned on to, or an idea that I was turned on to, uh, from John actually, was a, a program down in the Bay Area called BMV, or Below Market Value, where there's a, the potential like working with developers to have some percentage, and uh, it's not a very large percentage, but some percentage of development basically be assigned as property that is sold below market to qualified buyers. And then when those buyers are ready to move on from that property, the basically there's there's caps on how much it's allowed to go up as well. It's something I'd like to look at. Great, thank you, John. Sorry, to kind of piggyback on what Mr. Miller and Mr. McDougall have previously stated, and what I touched on a little bit in my opening re opening remarks, uh, I feel like we could make incentives available to the builders, as he had said, a smaller percentage. If a certain percentage of their developments do file under what we could call affordable housings, we can ease tax burdens on them for the cost of developing these properties. We could start easing burdens on people if they want to build upwards and offering more space, more actual living space for the land that's available too. We have a lot of directions we could build up just as much as we can build out. We're running out of space to build out, but we can still continue to build up. Great, thank you. Anthony? Well. I honestly, I echo many of the sentiments already expressed here, but there's a truth that we really have to deal with. All of the cities that I've been involved with, I'm involved across the county, are talking about low-income housing. We have to be honest and decide where we want it. Do we really want it here, or do we like the idea of low-income housing and where we can put it? I think, though, that um, one of the things that we really um, should consider is that multifaceted approach to development. And honestly, I think that we have a great opportunity. We need it. I just want us to look at how we can do it responsibly with the land that we have and also allow people a chance to, um, you know, have a, enjoy some of the things we do here in Anacortes that makes it home for all of us. Great, thank you. Sarah? Yes, the, it's a real problem for the housing. It's actually a crisis. And it's not only in Anacortes, it's across the region. Mm -hmm. So I think the council really does need to take some strong steps. Working regionally with other agencies to explore our options. I know in the past there was a lot of success with self-help housing mm -hmm. in Skagit County. And I think we are going to look at density is going to provide more affordable, but it's very important that we involve those future residents in the design so that it is not just low-income housing, undesirable. It has to fit into the community. There's other programs. Martha's Vineyard's another island, very wealthy island community, has come up with some programs. They have a, a, a fund for first-time families, and they also have a tax reduction, and we can give... Um, again, work with the builders to give a percentage to more affordable. Great, thank you. We'll be going on to our second question and starting with Bruce this time. The second question is actually a two-part because I see two question marks in the, uh, in the question. How important are the refineries to the future of Anacortes? Do you feel it's important for the city council and the mayor to publicly support the refineries initiatives? Thank you for the question. Um, the refineries are tremendously important to the local economy. I think there's <coughs> there's a great deal of employment that they that they provide both to citizens of Anacortes, but also throughout the throughout the county. Um, <coughs> I think the the refineries have have some real challenges facing them in the next 20 to 30 years. That may or may not, you know, that there's very little that the city actually has much control over. Um, the, <coughs> the way the energy economy is going to be shifting over the next 20 years, the, the refineries are going to have a challenge where they're going to have to probably adjust their business models into to looking into other types of business. I know that the, the xylene proposal is, <coughs> is at least one of those, uh, one of those directions. So I don't, I don't know at this time that that there's anything that I feel from a policy standpoint changing as far as in relation to the refineries right now. Just keep your communication lines open. Thank you, Bruce. John? 
Um, I think the refinery's existence and operation is important to our city uh, and our city's future as a, as, as a separate entity from the future that they face with green energy coming about and studies and funds and uh, research going into green energy. I think the fact that they are a large employer who employs a great percentage of people, who employ a great percentage of people in our community with great paying jobs and great benefits for our community. Each one of them is a family sustaining job. Each one of them has great benefits in terms of medical and all the retirement and all that stuff. They offer great jobs out there. Uh, I, I feel as a city, we need to support that in any aspect. If, if, if there's a company that's providing that for our city, we need, to st we need to support them and do everything we can to keep them here and keep them operating in our city while we, if, if we can as a city, facilitate the shift into greener energy, do everything we can to do that as well. Thank you, John. Anthony? I serve on the CTAG committee, which is a middle committee that um, listens not only to the community and sort of gauges uh, sentiment issues, bring that to Tesoro, take back knowledge from Tesoro back to the community. It's an independent group. The thing that I learned in serving these last years on that committee was that just, you know, the, the value of the refineries in our area is tremendous, not only um, for the revenues that they supply to the city, but the jobs. But at the same time, we have a corporate responsibility, a civic responsibility for providing a future, an environment of future that's positive for our community. We all enjoy this thing that we call anacortes in the forest lands that's so beautiful that attracts all of us there. I do believe that there's a hybrid and I think that there's a way that we can be Fiscally responsible, but yet environmentally very friendly. Let's look for the middle. It's not either one or the other. I think there are solutions, and we're ready to bring those to the table. And as a city, if we can help, we would definitely do that. Thank you, Anthony. Sarah? Yes, the refineries are very important to our community. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about uh, who has jurisdiction over the ref refineries. They contribute a lot to the school district's funding and that helps all of us living in the city. But the city does not really have um, any authority over that. That would be county and also the, the federal environmental type um, agencies. With that said though, we should support them and have a great relationship, great communication, maybe shared committees, and encourage them as much as possible to move towards new ideas and energy. They are energy companies and they will continue to be that way into the future. But even uh, in North uh, Europe, they're exploring different kinds of production of energy as uh, we do look at uh, an energy, uh, different energy future. Thank you, Sarah. Matt? So I unapologetically support our refineries. They're critical to uh, Anacortes. Uh, many of my friends and neighbors work at the refineries. And back to the previous question about affordable uh, housing, it's one of those jobs that even without a um, college degree, you can afford to actually live in Anacortes and work at the refineries. So it's absolutely critical uh, to Anacortes. Largest employer, the two refineries together. Um, and as far as the uh, tax input, they pay a significant amount in uh, utility tax to the city of Anacortes, and somebody who has had to uh, vote on budgets for the last three years in the city, I, I recognize how critical that is. And yes, we've raised a number of your uh, taxes recently and, and utility fees, but without the refineries, they would be double that. Uh, so you need, to, you need to think about that. And of course, I strongly support um, Tesoro's um, clean energy uh, clean energy project. It's something that they're looking at and all the oil companies are, are looking at approximately 30 to 40 years from now peak consumption. We all drive, you know, we're 99% uh, of my constituents use those products. So it's very important. Thanks. Thank you. And nice segue into the next question, which is the community is facing a serious increase in utility fees and property taxes. What is your proposal for maintaining our critical infrastructure without relying on similar tax fees increases in the future? And we're going to start with John. It is my opinion that we can stabilize our increase in uh, utilities in all in, 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 in all in, in tax excuse me not utilities in tax increases 
by making a more, what's the word I'm looking for here, excuse me, a more financially sound use of our water rights. We have plenty of water here. We can provide water to other people, other communities, at a gain to our community to where we can level off the need for tax increases as a, as the city of Anacortes. Thank you, Councilman. Quite honestly, um, many of the, or all of the amenities that we love here in the um, area, such as the waterfront, uh, the walking trails, um, the forest lands, the fact that we have lakes on our island, the fact that we have an a, a wonderful amount of people and resources and volunteerism, cost. And if our question is, is more about resource management, are there ways that we can improve? Sure it is. But are there other opportunities to bring in additional resources? Yes. Sometimes we, in partnering and taking a hard look at what we've done and looking at what we could do, it costs maybe just a little bit, but the long-term benefit that we all enjoy, such as this city that we are, everybody seems to be migrating to, has, is going to cost us just a little bit. So we just have to work hard. I'm not a proponent of increasing taxes. I'm looking for fiscal responsibility, and I pledge to take a hard look and be honest with you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, please proceed. Part of the reason why the uh, utilities went up so much was because there was a lack of planning in the, in the past. I know when I moved here um, 17 years ago, I was pretty surprised that it seemed like the sewer rate was high, but when I realized that it was a treatment plant that was cleaning the water and taking care of the Salish Sea, I, I accepted that because it was that important. We had the same issue with the water treatment plant. They did not plan for upgrades in, in a timely manner, and so current residents kind of got hit with a bigger jump than was necessary. So I hope that the city will do better long-range planning for these kind of infrastructure issues. And uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Matt, the floor is yours. Well, I appreciate the question because that, that means the citizens are noticing and you should notice that we did raise those uh, rates recently. The main reason for the increase is we were coming out of the economic downturn and there was a, a conscious choice of previous administration to, um, to hold off on some of the infrastructure projects. But a perfect example, your water rates went up because we have a uh, uh, three, three million gallon water tank uh, on Whistle Lake Road that is uh, was built in 1970 and it needs to be replaced and that's a, a priority for the city government is provide that infrastructure and and give you that great water that we enjoy uh, and and sometimes you have to do that and, but additionally things like our roads at least you're you're seeing some benefit of those increases like the downtown uh, paving project I think uh, you're 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 getting some benefit from that. Uh, but it's I infrastructure is a difficult and expensive thing, especially when they tell us that the road to re resurface all of our roads, it costs us as much as our entire city budget in one year. So that's something we have to continue to look at. Thank you. Bruce, okay. please proceed. I think uh, both Matt and Sarah actually said it really well. Um, we basically have gone through a phase where we're catching up from a, a long period of t time of deferred investment, essentially. So hopefully this is a short-term phase and we can actually get back to more normal. And also I tremendously agree with the, the point of long-term planning being really critical for, uh, for not having these kind of hits come up in the, in the first place. Uh, secondly, I'm looking, I'm very interested in pursuing alternative sources of revenue and that's really what the fiber optic project is kind of all about. It's basically the city acting as a bit of a venture capitalist itself by developing this technology infrastructure that not only has a retail side to it where the citizens get internet service or purchase internet service, but there's a tremendous upside for, for wholesale services to wireless providers, to, uh, to research institutions, to, uh, to any number of, uh, of ent business entities in the future. Thank you. We're going on to our next round of questions. We'll be starting with you, Anthony, this time. How important is it to you that Anacortes retain its working manufacturing base what types of manufacturing do you support? That's a good question. 
um, it's incredibly important that we continue uh, our working town atmosphere, culture, and climate. It is so unique from many of the other cities that have gone so largely toward tourism. I think tourism is important, but we are a working town that's enjoying some of the things that everybody wishes that they can be. I think that when we start thinking about manufacturing, when we start thinking about small businesses, the support of small businesses is here in this town is so important. As Bruce said earlier about the benefit of high-speed internet, I think about being responsible to size. I think big projects here on the island wouldn't work. But when you start thinking about that there's two million people that take the ferry and go to the San Juan Islands, and of that two million people, if 1% were business owners, we already have a pool of people that we can attract here if we target them. And so what I'm saying is we can pick and choose what we want, but it is incredibly important that we support the downtown businesses and um, vitality in the life we enjoy here. Yes. Thank you. Sarah? Could you repeat the question, please? Certainly. How important is it to you that Anacortes retain its working manufacturing base? What types of manufacturing do you support? Yes, that's part of my opening statement was to say we are a working class town and I want us to stay that way. <coughs> and yes, I think manufacturing is, there's a lot of opportunity. We have a lot of undeveloped land along Highway 20 that would be great for manufacturing. And with the high speed fiber optic coming in, that's going to open up a lot of potential. And the more we support a great quality of life in this town, entrepreneurs are going to want to locate here. I think the kind of manufacturing I'd like to see, of course, would be towards the green energy. I, I don't know why we can't start solar panel manufacturing instead of having it being done in China. So I really do support manufacturing and um, good jobs here in Anacortes. Thank you. Matt? Well, we are very fortunate to have some high-quality manufacturers, both in the uh, refining business and in the um, um, maritime trades. And it's the maritime trades that I think Anacortes has a very long history of, of being part of that. And that's a critical part of our working waterfront. Uh, industries like Dakota Creek, uh, Cortland uh, Rope, I mean, these, these are the heart of our manufacturing, and we need to continue uh, to make sure that they're successful by working with the port and working with those businesses to do whatever we can uh, to make sure they continue to be su successful. That's been a challenge because, you know, all the thing we always talk about is, well, we'd like to have access to the waterfront. Well, that's challenging when your, your, your biggest manufacturers are working on the waterfront. But I've had the opportunity to go down to see all the different uh, marine trades, and it's just amazing all these small uh, trades that this is a unique part of the country that you have so many different highly skilled uh, folks in the maritime trades working here. We need to continue to uh, develop that. Thanks. Thank you. Bruce, please proceed. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I, our, our manufacturing culture here, as well as just job base, is absolutely critical to, to the community. And, and, you know, all across the U.S., a lot of communities of our size have basically lost their initial manufacturing base, and it has left a lot of communities pretty hollowed out. And in order to, to compete as a small community in the 21st century, um, having a manufacturing base that is focused on, on really on, on, I guess, technologies and, and products and services that are hi as high up the economic chain as possible is also really critical. So boat, boat building and high-end boat building is, is really a, a terrific industry to have in town. I would like to see it expand into green energy as well and into materials science, working with, say, the Janicki folks. Um, I'd like to see expansion of our, our, our jobs training and education uh, and sort of research area as well uh, to, to basically produce more workers for these, uh, for these um, companies. Thank you. Thank you. John, the floor is yours. Um, I feel the uh, manufacturing base here in Anacortes provides uh, a lot of jobs. I feel that it's an Im they, it, it provides the kind of jobs that is are, are unique to our community. We ha we manufacture things that we sell and use here in our community at the rope factory. We sell and use all that rope here for all of our fishing. 
the boats that we build here in town over at Nordic Tug or even at DC, they're all right here. We get to see it. We get to actually be a part of it. A lot of you are actually have friends or family that work in our local manufacturing. Um, Dakota Creek employs close to 300 people, I think, here in town, and they're constantly, it's, it's very important to keep uh, a diverse job base in our town, too, not just for the sake of what they're building, for the fact that we have lots of jobs to offer the people who come to our town. If, we ha if they want to be welding, they can be welding down at Dakota Creek, or they can build the boats at Dakota Creek. We have Nordic Tugs, a rope factory. We have a research and development firm that made a, made a, uh, a prototype for a space shuttle. I mean, we do a lot of really cool manufacturing here in our community, and I think it's important to keep that focus. Great, thank you. We managed to uh, finish the, uh, the advertised questions well under budget. That's a good, under your time budget, that's a good start. Um, we have some extra questions and some extra time, so I'm going to go ahead and ask those. The first one is, uh, and we're going to start back with Sarah again from the top. Do you support the Guimas Channel Trail? What are you willing to do to complete it? Give me a shovel. <laughs> 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 yeah, the trail's amazing. I go out, out there a lot, and it's um, it's got a missing link to get to downtown, and the city's been trying to negotiate access to that. What am I willing to do? I don't really know. We, it's privately held land, so we do have to work with um, the willingness of that owner, and I think just the more we have that conversation and, and as they see the benefit and actually how well used and respected the trail is and how it can be an economic benefit to um, those in, uh, properties. Some are actually homes, so there is more concern for safety and privacy. And I think there are lots of um, solutions for that. And I hope to see that trail completed very soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. So what am I willing to do? I was going to turn this question over back to you uh, there, Jeff, and say <laughs> how much more. No, uh, but all seriousness, I'd like to thank our representatives in Olympia because they've actually helped, helped us uh, at least uh, lay out a path to get additional funding to do that because uh, one of the challenges, like I mentioned earlier with the Guimas Channel Trail, which of course I support it. Uh, as far as I know, all the members of the city council, the mayor, are all supportive of a trail that goes from Washington Park uh, through the Tommy Thompson Trail. Uh, I think it would be a fantastic asset to our community and, and we're continuing to work towards that. Challenge, one example of the challenge is you have a working waterfront and a, a privately owned working waterfront. So working with those landowners uh, to come up with innovative solutions. And the one way you can come up with innovative solutions is with help of big money that we don't have here, but the state has uh, been able to help us out and plus the uh, uh, private uh, uh, support to that as well. But that's it. Great, thank you, Matt. Bruce? I f forgot on the previous question I wanted to add, it's not really necessarily thought of as manufacturing, but I'd like to see us do more software manufacturing here in town as well. On the Guimas Channel Trail, I would love to see it completed. And I'm not sure exactly what is it with, within our control to be able to, to do so, at least with the private homeowners. Um, I'm looking forward to dialogue on it, as well as with the, the, um, the business entities on the port as well. And, and hopefully we can, can see through to having it complete here in the next few years. Thank you, Bruce. John? As far as the Guimas Trail goes, I would love nothing more than to see it completed. I would love to see it go through the waterfront businesses, fenced off somehow, and little signs talking about what all these businesses do along the trail. You walk through Dakota Creek, have a safe walkway through Dakota Creek with a little sign talking about the stages of what's going on, like an interpretive educational little, like the rest of the walk is out towards Tommy Thompson. Uh, several years ago, I, I don't know how to touch on the issue of the private property because that's other people's property. If they don't want a trail going through their property, there's not a whole lot we can do to put a trail through their property. Um, you know, I'm open, I guess I'm open to dialogue and talking about it, but I had previously spoken with over a, over a beer with Brian Cladisby out at the tribe at the casino and talked to him personally about continuing the trail to the casino and if the tribe would have any funding in on that and he was open to hear about that too so there might be some funding available for more trail development if we pursue that route thank you anthony 
I am an absolute supporter of the Guimas Trail. Matter of fact, when I first moved here to the town, I had the pleasure of meeting a wonderfully tall woman by the name of Michelle Pope. And I, she was giving a presentation and I had been in town just su such a short time and I volunteered and said I would help, thinking that she would probably call me in a month or two. The next day I had a phone call <laughs> and she was organizing. And it was such a beautiful thing, an introduction to community. As I've watched the trail go all around the city, it is such a glistening star for our community. It is definitely needed. Do we really need to try to find a solution to make it happen? Absolutely. I think that we need to keep all of our options on the table. Some, when we think about the benefit to the whole community, it's so important. But we recognize long-term relationships, friendships, and families, and the importance of maintaining those things. But the trail is so important to what makes Anacortes Anacortes and the reason everyone continues to come here as much as we try not to advertise it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go on to the next extra question. We'll start with Matt this time. We have a well-documented pavement study that indicates what level of investment is needed to maintain and improve our streets. Since we seem to be underfunding that plan, what changes to our budget and taxing plan would you propose and support to ensure that street improvement plan is accomplished? I touched on this a little earlier, but uh, I support the plan that we're currently on, that I voted on, and that was to uh, set aside $1.1 million for the initial couple of years, and you're seeing the fruits of that labor at this point, and then bring the experts, and I, I almost used air quotes for experts, because you know, there's, it, there's some science to that, and there's a little bit of art, but when somebody comes to me as an expert and says, the only way to get your streets up to, up to snuff is you've got to pay $65 million over the next 10 years, and like I said before, our city budget is approximately $60 million a year, so that's not something that the council is going to do. If anything, to fund that, we would have to come to the voters uh, for that. So the challenge, and, and I know the mayor gets to hear this all the time, the challenge is, oh, it's great you're paving the downtown. Did we really need that? What about my street? And we, don't, we, are, we are working on, on that plan in the future. But we're spending some money. We're going to get the experts back to get an updated of our, our condition index. Thank you. Bruce? Yeah, so the, uh, the existing, the 1.1 million per year for, for a few years plan went in before I uh, came on board, but uh, I do support that as well. Um, and, and essentially, I, I don't think we can go and just pave all, all the streets all at once. Uh, like, like Matt was saying, this is a, it's a $60 million project, and that's the budget of this city for the entire year. So um, unfortunately, a rolling investment is probably what we're looking at. We'll do our best to, to get that rolling investment happening over the course of probably several years. Thank you. John? <clears throat> when I had first decided I wanted to run for city council, the roads and lack of sidewalks and their conditions were a big part of that push. Um, my grandpa had fell and hurt his head over by O Avenue, and it was the site because of the sidewalk that needed was in, was in disarray. And since I've made my decision to run for council, that's one of the issues I've done a little bit of research on. And I honestly have to agree with the, the motion that the council is going towards right now, that there's, there's no budget to do it all at once. There's no overnight solution. And right now, the, the little over a million dollars a year we're putting into it is all the money that there is to put into our roads right now. Um, I would love to see the sidewalks. Uh, on every street between commercial and R Avenue. I would love to see every one of those roads up to repair and not have, you know, ditches you drive off into. And <clears throat> I was very impressed and pleased with the, uh, the rate in which the downtown streets were redone and I'm optimistic for the future. And we will get our streets paved back together. It's just gonna take a little more time. Thank you, Anthony. Quite honestly, there's no silver bullet. And right now, I think, and what I've been able to see and understand from the city, they've done a tremendous job about squeezing every single dollar they can toward the improvements that we currently have. I have been impressed by what we do have in com comparison to many other cities. I do think, though, that there are other solutions that we can work with. Again, continuing to partner ever heavily with our representatives and um, seeking every opportunity for funding, partnering, using our assets. What I mean by that is the fact that we have a ferry system and the 20 corridor going down to the ferry, those are assets. 
you know, the resources that we currently have, those relationships, looking for opportunities, whether it's grant dollars, whether it's partnership dollars, whatever we need to do, I just think everything is on the table. And as your council person, I promise to delve deeply and sincerely into finding solutions and working and partnering to make it the best thing that we can be at the time that we have. Thank you. Sarah? <coughs> I think the, <coughs> the funding right now is um, it's a good start. I'd like to see more community information about which streets are getting priority because I hear a lot of that. Obviously, commercial had priority, but what about the other streets? And maybe s I actually have heard people say, we don't want our street paved because we don't want more traffic. Well, maybe we do need to listen to the neighborhoods. And also, long range, maybe we should come up with some more creative um, look at sustainable ways. Perhaps we don't need sidewalks on both sides of the street in some neighborhoods. And when you have a development go in and it's required to have a sidewalk, it's one like 100 feet of sidewalk where there is nothing else, couldn't that money ha have been put in to actually paving the road instead. So I think we need to be creative about that because mm -hmm. it is a big need to get our streets in good shape. Other questions? Okay, we'll keep going then. So um, this will, we'll start with Bruce this time. Um, what activities by the city would you support to attract new businesses and employees to the city? For example, more active recruitment, tax subsidies, fee reductions, or waivers, et cetera. I think the, the biggest one that I'm working on is the, the technology, the fiber optic uh, project, which is hopefully going to attract <coughs> quite a bit of business investment and as well as actually we're seeing a trend toward there's work from home professionals as well or even just startups starting up out of uh, garages. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see basically that project come to its fruition because I think it'll drive a great deal of, uh, of economic development within the community. Um, other pieces I'm interested in, in looking at is if we can, <coughs> excuse me, if we can expand the, the Marine Tech Center to look at materials science and computer science mm -hmm. uh, programs as well to, to basically fuel both, um, <coughs> you know, additional workforce for, for our firms as well as potentially to, uh, to have folks come out of that are going to be starting businesses. Um, I'm also interested in exploring partnerships with universities um, and making use of the fiber optic network as a means of basically building research networks. Thank you, John. Uh, um, I think it's important to attract new businesses to our community as well as maintain the ones that we already have here. Um, personally, as, as somebody who uh, helps run a business, I would like to see employee taxes waived for new companies, new startup companies in Anacortes. That alone in itself will cut out huge portions of your startup costs for a bit to starting up a new business here in town. I would like to see incentives for, <coughs> excuse me, I would like to see incentives for employers for, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have something in my throat. Excuse me, I would like to see more done about hiring local people, but we really can't hire local people when they can't afford to live here. And as, as a business owner, that is really the biggest problem is hiring and maintaining a staff of people. If people can afford to live here, then they can afford to work here. Great, thank you. Anthony? As I was saying earlier, there are about two million people that go to the San Juan Islands that love it, that rave about our area. Uh, that decide that they love to come back and repeatedly come through. In some places, we're known as the fairy town, and that's all they know about Anacortes. The question is, how much do we really want to say who we are? Do we want to roar and tell the world that we're Anacortes and come to us? Or do we want to selectively choose those businesses that we want to attract, such that we create that economic benefit? So if 1% of those two million people are business owners. That leaves about 2,000. Of that 2,000, if we could somehow reach them and selectively reach for those businesses that we want would be a cultural fit to our island, we are also going to increase those revenues and opportunities. I think telecommuting, 
um, businesses, small businesses, even in corporate offices can be here and operate remotely. I just think that there's another way to look at it. And given what um, Bruce was talking about, those are tools in our quiver that will benefit us in the long run. And I'm looking forward to taking a hard look and seeing how we can help the island become what it wants to be. Thank you. Sarah? We can uh, attract new businesses. We do have to market ourselves. I think we could do more with having a development position at the city. And incentives are great if they're a short-term ta tax reduction for a business that we do see fitting in. I think we have such a wonderful foundation also in the arts and music community. Uh, there's a local recording company. There's just, I think, again, we should clarify our character and our uniqueness, and people will want to bring their businesses here. And we can also benefit more from the tourism. I think there's ways all of the people that are going, th just traveling through to the ferry, we can um, promote them coming into town more. I know that's been said all the, for years and years, but we got to keep working on it because it is a great economic opportunity. Thank you, Matt. Well, that question you could almost ask, well, how in our business, a small local business owner, how do we attract more customers? You know, that's it's the same challenge, and it's always a challenge, and it will continue to be a challenge. Uh, it's I said a couple of folks have already said it, uh, but one of the things we see in our business that is, is keeping our business going is tourism. So as part of that, uh, I was a member of the Anacortes Chamber of Commerce brand strategy team. So welcome to your island getaway of Anacortes. Um, I think she paid me to say that. Um, but Anacortes is a unique place. Around, you know, I've traveled around the world many times and, and lived in a number of different places, and it's such a unique place to be. Uh, we do have to um, realize that people are going to want to come here and, and visit it, so we need to continue to market it. So tourism is a big part of part of that. The education piece as well, uh, we think we have an opportunity for not necessarily the, the four-year degree, but we've got industries where uh, some of the marine trades to build on our marine trades right here, and with Shannon Point, uh, of, you know, the quiet place that we don't see very often, you know, Western Washington University has got a big facility right here, so we need to leverage off of that as well. Thank you all. I've been given the uh, high sign to wrap this. Once, once again, thank you all for taking the time and the energy and putting your talents for our community. So we're going to do one more dais change, and we're going to invite Mayor Lori Gear up and uh, have some questions from her. All right, thank you all for staying engaged this evening. Um, and again, I want to thank Mitchell upstairs for filming this for us. And it will be on Channel 10, and when I get permission from the mayor, possibly on the website. But Mitchell said I needed that permission, so I'll, I'll be calling you. Okay. All right, Jason, uh, take it away. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. How are you today? I'm well, great. How are great. you? Great. So we've you. scheduled you for a two-minute opening and four questions, and I might give you a fifth one. So that's okay. the plan. Okay, a bonus one, question. One, one okay. minute answers. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce to, uh, for hosting this evening. I think it's so important that we have it 
open forums when we can come together as a community and talk about what's important to our community. So thank you for that. And I want to tell you that I'm, I'm Lori Gear, and I'm your mayor, and I, I'm running for a second term unopposed. So um, it's, it's been an honor to serve this community. Um, I am a, a person that comes from a public servant heart and family, and this is the ultimate gift in my life to be able to serve this community. So I'm so excited to continue the work that my, um, myself, the city staff, and the council have done the last four years. And um, I think we're the most beautiful, sustainable, vibrant, friendly, not so affordable, safe community. And I'm here uh, to serve you. All right, great, thank you. Our, your first question. How do you propose to bring together conflicting ideas about development in Anacortes? Well, by the end of this year, we will have completed our development regs and our design standards that will allow us to put our comprehensive plan, our visioning uh, policies that we've spent a year and a half working, two years working on, um, that lays out a 20 year plan. We'll be able to put that vision into action. And we've been able to do that from public participation. We just received the Governor's Award for Community Participation. If you come to the City Council meeting on Monday night, we've been recognized for having, I think, over 1,000 participants and close to 90 um, meetings. And so that's how you do it. That's how you take conflicting ideas and you just keep working them together as a community and we've come up with a great plan. Great, thank you. And this is kind of a follow-up to that. Please share what you would like to see on the MJB properties, and what would your approach be to uh, work with the principals to bring that vision to okay. fruition? I'm, I'm excited about the MJB properties. Since the day I came into the office, the Merlino Joan brothers have been at, at my office. They've been at the table. They, they were involved in the comprehensive plan process, and they told me when we get the development regs and the design standards complete, they will be here and they would build. They're looking at the, right now what it looks like, um, what the market would build would be more uh, residential and mixed use in that area with a possible hotel. So they're waiting eagerly for the end of this year and to have the rules in place so they know what our standards are and what the community expects. Thank you. How important is it to you that Anacortes retain its working manufacturer base and what types of manufacturing do you support? It's very important. And where I see manufacturing in this community, we're a maritime community. Maritime, marine trades is core to who we are. We've been that since Anacortes was founded. Um, I've just spent the last, actually this week with the Department of Commerce came up and we toured um, the DCI site and several other small marine trade businesses. We went out and spent time with the college, Western Washington University at Shannon Point. And um, they were very excited about what we have going on here. And then I ended my afternoon on Monday with the start of a marine strategic plan that the city, the port, and EDASC are, are working on together. We have asked 30 marine businesses to come and meet with us individually, tell us what their needs are, what their um, development needs are, what, what their challenges are, and what we can do for them. And so I'm looking forward, that is how we're gonna address this. Um, okay, I got the end, but maybe I can follow up on that one. Okay. okay. Uh, what role can the city realistically play in increasing family wage jobs in Anacortes? I think focusing on what's core to, core to who we are. And I'm gonna, after my discussion with the first couple of marine companies, I'm, I'm doubly committed to making sure that sector of our economy is taken care of because they provide um, family wage jobs. And we have family wage jobs in the health industry. We have family age, wage jobs out the refinery. But I think if we continue to support our marine businesses with the infrastructures they need, with you know, dredging, uh, with lay down, with parking, with fiber. I am a big proponent of bringing fiber because if we get fiber here, it'll be like electrifying the county 125 years ago. It will also bring everything that our businesses need to be successful here. 
Stephanie, we have time for two more? Yeah, okay. Actually, I think I'll go three. I got three good ones. Okay. Do you support residential zoning changes to higher density in some areas of Anacortes to create more workforce, family, and senior housing in Anacortes? I absolutely do. I think the biggest challenge that we have in this community, as it was addressed by some of the council candidates, is affordable housing. We have great um, low-income housing. We have a great um, out Anacortes Housing Authority, but what I want is workforce housing for all of our employees, whether mom works at the hospital and dad is starting out at Dakota Creek, or you work in a restaurant. Um, so anything we can do. And I think the development regs and design standards are going to bring bring allow a lot of that density around the core of the town and this should be nice housing ho homes that we're proud to live in you should have a nice place to live no matter what your income level is and i think the city may have to get even more proactive with the property we own and um helping the developers the cost of labor and materials and land really are the the hold up there so um, we may have to look at public, you know, as a public, as a community, how much do we want to do to support making that happen? Because I think all generations have a right to live and work here. Great. So this is a clarification question, and we're, we're kind of, this is a community service oriented okay. question time, so this all one's right. a little unique. But all right. um, the, the current cable TV channel that the city council meetings and this meeting is going to be shown on, uh, does it show the county commissioners' meetings, and if not, why not? Well, I, you know, I just looked into that, and that is a, apparently a, a contract we had with Comcast, and they only provided certain channels for a certain amount of money, and or et cetera, et cetera. So we've just met with them on two issues, that being one of them, and the other one is they, we wanted new technology because we have the old technology, and we've got we're live streaming meetings and. I'm being told by the public it doesn't sound so well at home. So it was strictly a contract with the, with the cable company that Great. we're renegotiating. Thank you. Uh -huh. And so the last question for you is, could you prioritize your top three initiatives in your next term? Affordable housing, uh, bringing fiber. Affordable housing, I've kind of touched on what I want to do there. Um, f bringing fiber to this community. Fiber, um, a, a open strong broadband network will allow um, for economic development like no other. It's a quality life issue for all of us, for our families, for our education. Um, it will, it'll, it'll, be a, it'll be a life changer. And I'm, in, I'm committed to open, transparent government and public participation. And a fourth thing, the trail. Um, <laughs> and thank you. The state has uh, put uh, 4.2 million in their non-motorized transportation budget, but it's a few years down the road. So I'm also working with individual businesses. And I've also, um, the city, we've applied for um, a couple of EPA cleanup grants. So if we could get those, we could go to the businesses and some of the, um, there's three other, there's two neglected um, uh, old canneries on the water and we'd like to help those owners of those property do cleanup because I think the, the, can the channel should be more than a trail. It should be um, working waterfront. You know, what else can we bring along with having a public trail and reinvigorate those, those old sites? So would you join me in thanking Mayor Gear for her time and her answers? Thank you. And thank you, Jason. That was great. Yeah. And Jeff and Stephanie, as always. Thanks all for all you do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Gear. Um, it's just a pleasure to work with you. And thanks for letting us use your beautiful city hall this evening. We really appreciate that. I really want to thank my moderators. It's a hard job. You did a great job doing it. So thank you. Um, Maybe we'll get to see Jeff and Chris around here a little bit more soon. I'm not sure. Um, I really want to also thank um, Pam Allen and Robin Pestorino. They're in the back there. You know, <clears throat> coming up with pertinent questions and vetting those that come from the audience is, a, is a, another tough job. Another job that seems not as hard as it is, but it is, it's the timers. You guys are... 
nicely keeping people on track. So thank you. And I, I know it's hard, and you just got to keep watching it and not making mistakes. So thank you, Amanda Hubick and Richard Rydell. Um, Dan Mall, thank you for greeting people and running questions. And Mitchell, up in the booth, thanks for taping. We'll see you all soon.